Well, if I was to say to you the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, there are a few things you might think of. The historically minded would probably think of the phrase that's in the United States Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, being three examples of the unalienable rights which the Declaration says have been given to all humans by their creator, uh, and which the American government is there to protect. Or, if you're slightly more modern and media-minded, you may think of the 2006 film, The Pursuit of Happiness. It's based on a true story, the story of a man named Christopher Gardner. Uh, the film takes its name from that phrase, The Pursuit of Happiness. Now, I haven't watched the film because by the time I thought, oh, I'll watch it last night, it was too late and there was no way I could get it finished before 10 o'clock in the evening. But I did look for a YouTube summary of it, the best place to go when you haven't got time to watch something in full. And the video I watched was useless, really, at summarising the plot. But it did look at some of the scripting things and how the story is told. One thing that stood out to me very much is the way that the filmmaker sets out the goal of Christopher Gardner and the motivation behind it, and keeps building those up through the film. It's an old film, so I don't feel too bad giving spoilers, but if you do want to look away, put your fingers in your ears now, his goal is to be a stockbroker and to earn money. He is uh, in a, a situation where he is poor because previous business ventures have failed, and he needs to earn money. The motivation for earning that money is to be able to provide for his son, who is four or five years old, who he is left looking after after his wife has left him. And by the end of the tale, there's a heartwarming success. And perhaps I should get round to watching the film. It sounds like a reasonable way to spend a couple of hours. Yeah, I can already feel myself rooting for him to succeed because his motivation is an admirable one. But could the same be said about any pursuit of happiness? I want that job because I want to be rich. I want that job because I want to be the boss and be in charge. I want to do X because I do. It's very easy for motivations for achieving a goal to become pleasing myself. For the motivation for doing anything to actually be my pleasure. So often we become set on generating wealth or earning money or having a good time. Uh, sorry, because we want to spend it on having a good time, on pleasure. We want to gratify the desires that we have of the senses or of the mind. We want to feel the excitement or the satisfaction of something that we deem good. And it does feel good to have a little bit of retail therapy at the shops or to win a bid on eBay. To enjoy that extra episode of that TV show that you just can't stop because they've left the episode on a cliffhanger and even though it's past midnight, I really do want to know what happens. Not to mention the holidays, the good times, the parties, anything that money can afford. Life's little luxuries, as we might describe them. But as we live as people who have a different king and a different motivation, shouldn't we be different? Christianity sometimes raises questions. It's often seen as, well, isn't pleasure sinful? Isn't Christianity the anti-pleasure, no-fun religion? After all, we all know the phrase, aren't we supposed to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus? Pause the question the other way. Should happiness be the thing we pursue? It's a question not just restricted to just our context, too. One Christian from another country wrote this. Uh, when my wife who is from a Western background, was coming into adulthood, her mother's philosophy was, whatever makes you happy, dear, will also make me happy. 
He writes, my parents are Chinese, and as I was coming into adulthood, my mother's philosophy was, son, whatever makes me happy will also make you happy. Either way, happiness was the assumed personal goal in life in most cultures. Maybe that's not even just an individual thing. Governments clearly try and please the most people, not least just to keep the opinion polls on their side. What will do the most good for the most people? Keep the most people happy and keep me in office. Or at least that's the line they feed us anyway. You don't have to be a Christian, though, do you, to know that economic prosperity doesn't necessarily buy happiness. Underlying assumptions that life is about our happiness can be all-consuming. So what does Proverbs, what does the wise God have to say about pleasure? Well, I have three things that it says in summary, and I have to admit this is the hardest talk in the series so far. Uh, well, although every talk has been the hardest so far, it's just trying to summarise the big themes of Proverbs spread across many chapters is challenging. But first thing we need to see, wisdom does speak positively of pleasure. See, to feel delight and to be glad in heart is part of the good for which we can thank God. Even the fruit in the Garden of Eden was not only good for food, but pleasing to the sight. Food doesn't have to taste good nice, but it does. There is nothing inherently good in suffering or pain either. The underlying assumption in Proverbs is that pleasure and delight is good Otherwise, many of the sayings don't make sense. Imagine this one. An evil man is ensnared in his transgression, but a righteous man sings and rejoices. Well, if this delight is good, is not good, then singing and rejoicing wouldn't be good either. And the Bible definitely calls us to do those things. Let's, let's pull together some ideas about how Proverbs speaks positively on pleasure. Firstly, living wisely brings pleasure for you, uh, and you should have in your service sheet a sheet of other Proverbs that I'm also going to refer to that are just there for speed for you to find them rather than having to root forwards and backwards in the book. So chapter 10, verse 28, they're in order of chapter, by the way, if you want to follow them. So it says, the prospect of the righteous is joy, but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. You see, to the righteous, those who seek God, receive what they hope for. We're encouraged to hope. 29.6, an evil man is snared by his own sin, but a righteous one can sing and be glad. Once again, wisdom has its benefits. There is joy and singing and gladness. They are all pleasurable things. 24.13, eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to the, your taste. Know also that wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, there is, a future, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. See, the sweetness of honey, which we, we know, is compared to the sweetness of wisdom. It is delightful. Just as honey is sweet to the mouth, so wisdom is sweet to a whole person's whole life. But not only that, living wisely doesn't just bring us pleasure, it can bring others. Chapter, oh, I didn't write the chapter number. Um, oh, this is from the chapter we read. Listen to your father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she is old. But uh, Sorry, buy the truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom, discipline and understanding. The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. May your father and mother be glad. May she who gave you birth rejoice. If a child accepts his parents' instruction and pursues wisdom, he will gain wisdom. And that will make his parents rejoice. Notice 
as a side note, that mentioning when your mother is old here points that that doesn't end at the end of childhood, does it? So, living wisely brings pleasure. Choosing joy and cheer in otherwise uncheerful situations brings pleasure too. A happy heart, chapter 15, verse 13, makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. 15, 15, all the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. The heart is the centre of thoughts and attitudes here. It is these and not circumstances that are, to that can, are to determine our attitude to life. Yes, the lot of the afflicted is hard. But their attitude they choose to take that situation with can help give them some joy in life. Being willing to find contentment where you are and trusting those circumstances to the one who rules over all things, even if there's no change in their plight, makes a situation less uh, overwhelming. Finding the joy in the small things, you might say. In contrast, are those who resent or choose resentment of life's uh, circumstances, well, they can be recognised the effect it has on their heart and almost their whole persona. It can be this, the sorrow can be seen in their face and sensed in their spirit. So to not choose joy brings sorrow. Enjoying God and his provision brings pleasure too. So the father says, 23, 26, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes keep to my ways before listing a number of negative consequences of not doing so. We've already thought about the pleasure that food can bring. We thought of the fruit in the garden. We thought about honey. Prov uh, Psalm 104, going outside of Proverbs, tells us of wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil that makes his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. As we thought in our world together, we, God has made a good world with good things for us to enjoy. That includes knowing God and his provision. It includes good food and money. It involves righteousness and contentment. And spending time with other good and wise people. It is a good thing to enjoy the good things God has given. As long as they don't replace God in our thinking. If we end up worshipping the thing or the experience, then they have, they have become idols. Or you might want to call them God swaps. I've swapped God's place with this thing, money. I've swapped God for food, for wealth. You see, as we thought in our altogether slot earlier, Things aren't all good, are they? The same proverbs we've already read point to us that sin can steal pleasure. Bad or foolish people can bring grief and disappointment. Wealth and food are not guaranteed. Therefore, we need to be careful what we pursue. There are good pleasures. God has given us good pleasures. But wisdom then also follows that up by warning. Be careful what you wish for. So thinking back to our character in the pursuit of happiness for, to Christopher Gardner. Being a stockbroker could have gone wrong, couldn't it? It could have so consumed him that whilst he could provide for his son he could have ended up estranged from him. So proverb warns, pleasure it can be a good thing from God, but pursuing it with everything you have will disappoint. So to quote a few examples, uh, alcohol will harm you. We read that in, in the passage that Philip 
uh, read for us. Do not join those who drink too much wine and gorge themselves on meat. For drunkards and gluttons become poor. Drowsiness clothes them in rags. And then the passage continues with a whole series of rhetorical questions that are general descriptions of woe and sorrow, but actually conclude it the hang it's a hangover problem. Bloodshot eyes, bleary sight. The riddle, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has strife, who has complaints, who has needless bruises, who has bloodshot eyes? The person who lingers over wine. You see, alcohol is a good thing. I hardly doubt, I hardly think Jesus would have made... I wrote that down somewhere else. Would have made a whole, uh, of, uh, was about a thousand bottles of wines worth, I think it was, if he, wine was a, an entirely bad thing. But the teacher warns, don't gaze at it. Don't be seduced by it. Because it might go down smoothly, but it will bite you in the end. The bite it comes with a list of uh, effects, verse 33 of what we read, visions of seeing things in, uh, that aren't there. The sort of reeling, verse 35, a dangerous combination of dulled senses mixed with bravado. I can take it, says the drunk, feeling invincible, but actually going down like a boxer who's taken too many blows. A good gift, but can be used in a way that harms. And much more quickly, a whole series of other things. Proverbs holds up as good things of God that can and will disappoint if they become the be-all and end-all. So sex will sink you. Uh, it, chapter 23 that we read, My son, give me your heart, let your eyes keep to my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit, and a wayward wife is a narrow well. Like a bandit, she lies in wait and multiplies the unfaithful among men. Nothing good comes from idolizing sex. Food will bring misery. If you scam people for it, it will taste like gravel, says chapter 20, verse 17. But chapter 25, verse 16 says, if you find honey, don't only eat enough. Too much of it and you will vomit. I don't know if you have a story like this, but I can definitely remember times as a kid where actually I don't like that. And what it really means is the first time I had it, I ate too much of it and I was sick. Golden syrup. Still can't. Now, if you find it your desire in commentating and speaking your mind on everything, well, actually you can corrupt the conversation. A fool finds no pleasure in understanding. 18 verse 2 but delights in his own opinions. And beyond all of that, time will scupper most things we pursue. Nothing lasts forever. Chapter 14, verse 13. Even in laughter the heart may ache, and joy may end in grief. So seeking pleasure will disappoint. Pleasure seeking will also distort. You see, we have an appetite for things and if we indulge it that appetite grows you may notice I perhaps have an issue with food I, I miss the wooden thing that sometimes meant I could hide it but in our distortion and abuse of God's creation some of the activities we gain pleasure from become sinful so you take sex out of marriage and it becomes sexual immorality you take food out of eating enough or beyond eating enough, and it becomes gluttony. The desire to harm others is never a good thing. All examples, Proverbs holds up for us. But even pleasures that are not inherently simple can be a problem if they are pursued. So we've just thought about the use of alcohol. We can think about sex. We can think about relationships. We can even think about little devices like this. Great tools though they are, boy do they sabotage your concentration. Perhaps the most sinister warning Proverbs has 
about pleasure seeking is that it will not only distort, it will devour you. I don't know if you've seen the first of the Pirates of the, Pirates of the Caribbean films. The captain of the Black Pearl is called Barbosa. And as they attack Port Royal, he describes the reason they are going about it. You see, buried in the island of the dead, that which cannot be found except by those who already know where it is, find it we did. And there be the chest, and inside be the gold. We took them all, spent them, traded them, and frittered them away for drink and food and pleasurable company. But the more we gave them away, the more we came to realize the drink would not satisfy, food turned to ash in our mouths, nor the, com nor the, company in the, uh, nor the pleasurable company in the world would harm or slake our lust. We are cursed men, compelled by greed we were, but now we are consumed by it. Proverbs says the same thing. Chapter 27, verse 20. Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are the eyes of a man. We live in a culture of instant gratification that we need to acknowledge. Food is so easy to get hold of. It's so easy. Again, the phone, they just eat up. I, I, it should be deleted, perhaps. We've mentioned streaming and episodes. We can so easily go, oh, I just want to watch that. I know I should be doing that bit of work. Even just picking it up because, well, I'm not doing anything else and I just want the distraction. We can become addicted to pleasure in the same way that you can be addicted to drug or, drugs or alcohol. It can enslave us. We want another shot just to offset the boredom or the emptiness that we feel increasingly soon after the last. That's the law of diminishing returns, isn't it? We need more and more to satisfy the same pans. Oh, I had the quarter pounder burger that time, I had the half pounder next time, but they do this even bigger one. Oh, I watched an episode, I'll watch another. And what a cliffhanger! I must see what happens next at the start. I'll just finish the season. Ah, but there's a cliffhanger there as well. So I'll start the next season. <laughs> or the next movie. The next party. The next overseas holiday. The next purchase. The next post. The next like. Rather than serving God and enjoying his good gifts to us. Pleasure can so easily become a replacement God that we serve. We are taken captive by our own lusts, Proverbs 11, verse 6. To live with pleasure as our God looks very pleasurable. Let's not be, be dishonest with ourselves. In the same way that the forbidden fruit looked delightful to Eve's eyes... So can pleasure. But is that what we're supposed to pursue? Pleasure and pursuing it can mean that we miss God's message and plan for us. In Luke's account of the parable of the sower, Jesus talks about seed that fell among thorns that stands for those who hear but as they go on their way are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures. And they do not mature. And Titus writes to people who had been foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. But praise God, he writes, this is what you were. You see, Proverbs motivates us to love wisdom first, to fear the Lord. And it motivates us by parading wisdoms that, uh, so pleasures that come from that. It almost beckons our own self-interest. 
here are better pleasures. But still, pursuing pleasure is not meant to be our chief end. It is not about us. So finally, wisdom knows that joy is found in Jesus. The view that pleasure and happiness is something God should provide for us, that we're owed, that we're entitled to, can quite often become the focus of our whole lives. That, having that view, pursuing that view, is wrong. It's as wrong as the, this Sunday school child's understanding in this story. The Sunday school teacher was questioning her pupils after a lesson about God's omnipotence. Now, children, she asked, is there anything God can't do? And we're all thinking, no, God is, all, God is omnipotent. He can do everything. But one boy pipes up, well, he can't please everybody, miss. And nor does he seek to. Because we are created to find pleasure in him. So let's return to the motto of the book. See, there's only one person any of us should be concerned with pleasing, and it's not ourselves. Wisdom's motto is this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That fear of the Lord is for those who are not in the right relationship to him. By pursuing pleasures ourselves, we have uh, run up an account, a debt that must be settled. We deserve the wrath that would settle the account. But in Jesus, that can be settled. And so as those with the debt wiped clean and in a right relationship with the Lord, we can pursue wisdom. We can attach the right motivation to our goal. And that right motivation, our chief goal in life, is to be him who made us. To acknowledge him, to trust him with all of our hearts and follow then the path that Proverbs points us along to. So we've said all the way through this series, wisdom's motto points us to wisdom's king where the wise God here in this book is giving us his foolish people, the wisest king, that we might live wisely. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 5 a description of what that king has done that that might be possible. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, the wise God is our God. And so his aim needs to be our aim. We need to seek to please him. He becomes the motive behind any goal. And if the goal is not compatible with the motive, it needs to be changed. So Proverbs speaks in terms then of bringing pleasure and delight to the Lord. And we're going to dive into that using the questions on the service sheet on Tuesday. Let me finish with an illustration. Because there are so many things we could learn about how do we go about this practically. And helpfully in one of his books, The Screwtape Letters, 
C.S. Lewis records an, a fictitious exchange of letters between a senior devil and a junior devil who's been coached in how to befuddle a man considering God, in how to drag him away from a wise life, if you will. So he writes, keep him from going over to the enemy, is the charge. Some days later, the junior devil comes back with a grim report that he's lost the man to the other side. Could you not have seduced him, roared the senior devil? No, came the reply, because he did two things that took him away from us. First, every day he took a walk and also read good books. And the more he did that, the enemy seemed to draw him closer. Ah, that's where you made your mistake, said the senior devil. You should have had him take a walk for exercise, not for pleasure. You should have had him read a book, not for the goodness of it, but to quote it to others. You see, by not distancing him from the sheer enjoyment of good things, you brought him closer to the voice of the enemy and of course by enemy we mean God himself so some pleasure God given ones are good to desire we need to not detach the goal of what we're doing from the right motivation though but that's insufficient as a method we need to also not uh, justify a poor goal with the right motivation we need to pick the right motivation and pick the goal accordingly. Our chief goal in life is to fear the Lord, to acknowledge and trust him with all of our heart, and that is not a means to an end. It is the end itself. So let's not buy the lies that Christianity is anti-pleasure and, no, and a no-fun religion. That to, let's not buy the lie that to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow Jesus, is to lose out. The reality is that in doing those things, we gain everything. Eternal life with God. Forgiveness through his Son. And the Spirit's power as he instated our service to live wisely. Amen.